If you have an interest in horses and love learning more about horses, the horse industry, teaching, or even managing your own horse business, then you're in the right place. We would love you to join us on our mission, which is to improve the lives of horses around the world through the education of riders, handlers, and trainers. So get comfortable, listen in, and enjoy. This has been another episode sponsored by Online Horse College. If you haven't had a look at the wide variety of equine-specific accredited courses, then go to onlinehorsecollege.com and I'll see you over there. Sophie Barrington and Archer Creative are the experts in equine marketing. Sophie understands how to achieve success in the horse industry, providing innovative and outcome-driven marketing services that result in a dramatic difference to your bottom line. Go to horsechats.com, search for Sophie, search for Barrington or search for Archer Creative to find the equine business marketing specialists. Today, we've got Amy Power over from South Australia. Amy is from Power Equestrian. She's natural horsemanship trainer and she starts young horses and she's just recently been invited to compete in the Equitana Brumby Challenge. How are you, Amy? I'm great. How are you? Oh, very good. Very good. Now, Amy, there's lots and lots of things that we can ask you about Power Equestrian, about how it started, you know, what your background there is. Do you want to start with that, what what your background is with Power Equestrian, how it started? Yeah, sure. Um, I mean, I've always had horses from a, a very young age and yep. um, I travelled around Australia with work and ended up settling in Alice Springs uh, 10 years ago. Okay. Um, when, I, when I was there, I started helping people um, – with you know muscle problems and um, you know issues issues with horses, and it sort of all built up from there to mm-hmm. what we now have today. So we moved to South Australia. We've got uh, twenty three acres uh, down uh, here now, which we're up in the Adelaide Hills, which is just beautiful. Okay, um, yep. and we have um, quite a few horses in, and and that's sort of how it began. Perfect. All right, and you were just horses as well, don't you? Yes, we yes. do adjustment. Most yeah. of the adjusted horses that we have here now are actually retired. Okay, uh, it was a it was something that um, in Alice Springs you couldn't actually do. We we don't have anywhere to retire horses, so um, I actually have a lot of horses down from there, and we also have uh, some from other states as well. And are just here to live out their days up in mm-hmm. the the big back paddocks. So it's it's nice that they can come somewhere and uh, live out the rest of their lives and you know, enjoy it. So yep, they've deserved yep. it. All right. Now, Amy, we normally start off with a favourite quote. What do you have as a favourite quote? My favourite quote is, if it was easy, everyone would be doing it. And I know <laughs> that's quite a common quote, but I think in horses is something that we have to remember that it's it's not easy and it doesn't come quickly and we have to be patient and nurture our horses and learn ourselves uh, and if it was easy, I probably would be doing it because it's just so much fun. Yes, yes, definitely so much fun and, and so rewarding. And I think almost maybe people just don't know how rewarding it is. Uh, look, it is. And I, I think that's why my love for starting horses um, is really, yeah, it's grown into a huge passion. I always enjoyed it, but mm-hmm. I've really started to working with young horses and, and starting their careers right, yep. uh, making sure that they have the right foundations and that they're polite, well-rounded um, animals right from word go. And it is so rewarding to take something out of the pack that's maybe never been touched, yep. I guess, as such as the Brumby, um, up to, you know, a beautiful ridden horse. It's, it is very a rewarding career, that's for sure. Yeah, yeah. Now, do you remember your first horse that you started? Tell us about it. Oh. <laughs> and you know what? Don't just tell us about it, but feel free to tell us the lessons that you learned. I had a little Kamara pony when I was young, and I started um, bringing her on, and it was a massive learning curve for me about patience and listening to the horse. And, you know, when she was misbehaving, at that point in time, and I was quite young, I didn't really understand what the horse was trying to tell me. Um, now, of course, I can look back and say, 
that poor horse was, you know, very patient with me. And, mm. you know, she ended up going on to be a, a children's pony. But lessons learned from that were you really got to react quickly and reward so quickly. And, and your patience is sometimes tested because you can have quite difficult ones to start um, that have had, you know, have had a pretty terrible start to life and you're actually restarting them. I do a lot of that. Mm-hmm. So that now has, yeah, definitely a huge learning curve for me and I'll always remember that horse, Cindy, my little grey Connemara pony. <laughs> <laughs> the timing of the reward is so important, isn't it? Oh, absolutely. You just have to reward when you see that try and it's yep. not something that comes quickly to some people to see a little bit of try, but the more that you work with horses, the more little muscle twitch. There might just be a muscle twitch that's, mm. you know, enough of a reward, enough of a release. Um, but when you're starting out, if you haven't had that experience, what you're looking for, um, your rewarding is not quite as quick, but we all have to start somewhere, and I think that's why it's really important that we have the backing of somebody that we like their methods and we like the way their horses turn out and you ask for help. Um, Okay. That's that's a huge learning curve for me too. So So would that be your advice to young people who are thinking that they'd like to do some training, do some work getting horses going, you know, progressing them through, particularly starting off the young ones is, well, even the other ones, you know, it's if you want to go to the Olympics, you've still got to start and get some advice and get some help and improve your skills. And it'd be the same starting off the young horses, you know, go to someone who knows, get some advice, improve your skills and keep learning from them. Oh, absolutely. Um, You really can't do it without help. You need somebody to just help you with your timing, whether that be your horsemanship skills or Mm -hmm. whether that be in your riding. Um, If they did want to go to the Olympics, you know, your your timing of your reward to the horse, um, you know, if they move off your leg or you're teaching new movement and dressage, um, you know, it's really essential to just get that help to know what you need to feel and what you need to look for in order to progress that horse as best as you possibly can. Yep. And it takes a different amount of time for different horses and they all learn a little bit differently. So along the way, you may ride a horse and you think, yep, I've got that horse and I can do it. Then you'll get a different horse and mm. things are a little bit different and you just sort of have to tailor it a little bit. And that's that's where working with multiple horses is, yep. um, I find, really essential as well. Okay. Okay. Now, the other thing is for horses, you know, say someone wanted to come to you and wanted to be mentored by you, taught by you about young horses. What sort of person would they have to be for you to be interested in taking them on? Because, um, you know, there's no point putting a lot of time and effort into someone that you don't think is going to make it to be able to work with young horses. What sort of person would it be? It's someone that's really dedicated. And I think that the most important the thing that I look for when I'm mentoring somebody is someone that wants to listen. Mm-hmm. Um, they want to try what you do. And they may give you feedback to say, look, I don't think that this is working. Can we maybe do it another way? So also using their initiative and, and questioning sometimes what's going on if they're not sure what they're being asked to do. Um, if somebody asks you to do something and you're not sure why, I think it's really important for that person to to want to engage as well with me. Um, it's not a one-way street. It's, mm-hmm. it's very much a two-way street. But I, I definitely want somebody who really wants to do it um, and not just there because they have to be um, because you just don't learn that yep. way. Yep, yep. And we talked about the rewards. But, you know, how would you say the rewards are? What do you think are the key things that are the best things about working with young horses? Uh, look, it's... It's seeing them grow and develop and um, turn their, in a, a new career, and that may be just trail riding. Um, I think one of the, the most recent, apart from my Brumby, of course, is Brumby Challenge, um, will be a beautiful little uh, off-the-track thoroughbred that I had um, here. And the lady that had her just was absolutely in love with her, but had some... Um, bad information at the start um, and wasn't really aware of what 
was really going to be required to get this horse going. Mm-hmm. Um, she was pushed quite hard by an inspector and the uh, horse ended up rearing uh, and uh, falling on her, breaking her neck. Oh, wow. Um, but she did still want to... She really loved this horse and she ended up coming to me and we started off very slowly. Um, and in the end, she is now a lovely, quiet um horse that she can go out and just trail ride with and that's all she wanted um and I, I, that makes me really happy she sends me updates about you know she goes through water now and we go on roads and you know there's no problems at all and that also came down to her as the person um she came and had lessons before she took the whole time mm-hmm. um to know what the cues were and when the horse you know does certain things how to calm it down um and yeah, I, I find that part really rewarding to see that they go on to do what they are going to do and do well at it. And I think those lessons with the trainer are so essential. Trainers can do a wonderful job with a horse, absolutely wonderful. And if they don't actually teach the person what they've been doing so the horse has got that consistency, the horse can go home and not be very good at all. Don't you think the the lessons are very important? Oh, absolutely. I I will not break in or start a horse um, uh, for a person not to come and actually ride it and Mm -hmm. have lessons with me before it goes home because – if you get that phone call to say my horse is not doing anything, it's being really naughty, yep. um, It's they haven't learnt what you've actually taught the horse and all the horse is doing is telling you that it's confused and mm-hmm. it doesn't know what to do. Yep. It's not trying and they're not out there to hurt you. Um, they're just telling you in their language but they don't understand. So that lesson part afterwards and during even if, if someone wants to come while I'm yes. starting their horse and, mm-hmm. and learn during the process, that's even better mm. uh, because they see where the horse is at and how we've progressed through uh, to the point where they actually do get to go home. Yep, yep. What about, tell us about the Bromby that you had. What was his name? Uh, so I have a beautiful uh, chestnut gelding called VBA Brolder. Mm-hmm. He's a four-year-old and he was caught from Cognosco National Park. Um, I decided to keep him as the trainer. We do have the option to either keep them after Equitana or to um, auction them off at Equitana. I've decided to keep him because he is an extremely smart, very talented uh, young horse that's going to go a long way. Um, and I've had the most fun I've, I've had uh, with starting from scratch a horse with this guy and I did learn a lot in the process um, with him as well um, you know having to really be aware of their natural behavior what they do in the wild mm-hmm. you have to really be cued into uh, what they do in the wild because they're not the same as domestic horses they haven't had any interaction they're an absolute clean slate yeah. but every action has a reaction and you have to really watch that horse um, and and what they're doing and how they're reacting to you. So I think I've definitely uh, become a lot more. Uh, I don't even really know the word, I suppose, but sensitive to really small body language cues that I'm giving out okay. as well because okay. he was just so onto it. Yeah. Yep. 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 All right. I'm just thinking. You know, what did you do? You went over there to pick the horse up. How much work did you do with the horse before you actually brought it home? Uh, so none. So when we pick them up, they're mm. actually um, still wild. So mm-hmm. we have to hire a crate or something. Okay. Yes. That to put it in. Quite yep. big and open, um, and they load them on. Mm-hmm. Um, they basically have to go on themselves. They're not halted. They're, they're not trained. They are a hundred percent wild horses. Uh, we bring them home, um, and you know, start from here on day one. It's very strict guidelines on the conditions that the horses have to be in minimum height for the round yard because, you know, if you put a little bit too much pressure on, they will try to jump out. Oh, for sure, <laughs> for sure, yeah. Um, so they're, they're very regulated on, on the conditions for the horse um, and you have to give you weekly updates um, and photos through. Um, they see the horse through the whole 
um, 150 days, mm -hmm. um, as the public can see as well. So yep. anyone can follow us and, and see how we're going. So uh, was, yeah, great. So just briefly, just go over the process then that you did over the 150 days. You know, what sort of progression did you take? When did you first, you know, first ride the horse? When did you, you know, at what day, at what stage? Can you tell us a bit? So... When I first got him home, I just let him settle for the first day. So I was on the outside of the round yard. Of course, I'd go in and give him some hay and, and what. Um, and within the first week, um, he didn't want me to touch him at all mm -hmm. uh, within the first six days. Uh, on the seventh day, we I did manage to, to actually pass him for the first time. So it was, it was that advancement to him. And then as soon as he was looking at me and he was calm and licked his lips and relaxed himself, I would step back. So okay. that was basically all I did for six whole days was just, you know, letting go and not rushing up to him and I'm going and I'm threatening him anyway. Um, so on the seventh day, he actually let me pass him. Mm -hmm. By day eight, we had a head collar on him. And from day nine, we started the training process. So that was a lot of work on the ground, just asking him to actually be a bit closer to me. So, you know, you get some horses that don't respect space and they want to be on top of you. Um, he was opposite. He was a little reluctant to be in close. Yep. So just getting him comfortable with me being around him, touching him all over, starting to pick up his feet. Um, and then, of course, asking him to move himself away and come closer. And um, So the first sort of three weeks is really basic groundwork and, and uh, establishing trust. Mm -hmm. um, by week four, we had the saddle on um, and I was just doing some walk trot with the saddle on, not ridden yet. Then sort of at the end of week four, week five, um, I actually started to just sit on him and, and walk him around bareback with the halter on. So we still hadn't done any of the mounting process by, by that stage. I just wanted him to be comfortable with, with me being on him. Um, and then it was it was around about week seven or eight, I think it was, when I was on him uh, with the saddle on and him being really comfortable. We started to introduce pole work, moving off my legs, um, relaxation, walk trot. Um, he was a little uneven in... in uh, carrying his weight as as just about every horse is, but he had a real weakness mm -hmm. um, in his offside hind. So there was a lot of work that went into strengthening him up. I actually didn't get to canter him until around about, uh, it would have been probably week 15. Okay. Because he just... He just could, I wasn't going to ask him to do something that I knew he couldn't do because that was going to create confusion for him. So sure. we did a lot of work on moving away and, and picking up um, his feet, just carrying his weight mm -hmm. and getting his weight of myself. So in the end, I did start to mouth him around about week 10. Um, so he was, you know, very comfortable with the bridle by the time that we, we reached Equitana. Yep. And it was... A, you know, it was a, a long process um, because I just didn't want to push. I just didn't want to push the canter on him and know that he really wouldn't cope. So I, know, I knew that this was a competition, but at the end of the day, the horse's welfare is is much more important to me than a competition. Yeah, so yeah. We got over there. There were some Brumbies that weren't ready and and they didn't present at Equitana. Mm -hmm. um, but he was ready and he loved it. He had such a great time. He loved the people. He loved the attention. You know, and, and going from a horse that's just terrified of you to a mm. horse that just can't mm. get enough. It's good, isn't is, it? Yeah. It's a beautiful thing. Yeah, yeah. All right. And, and the 150 days, do you think that was a good time? You know, that sort of sh so you could get to the stage where you could walk trot canter even though you had that little bit of a setback. Do you think the 150 days is a good time to get to show your horse? Longer, shorter? Yes. What do you think? About right? Oh, look, the more, the more time you have, the more you can achieve, definitely. Mm. Mm. But I think to showcase the horse um, and, and to see 
the huge transformation that they can make. Yeah. 150 days. I don't think you'd want any shorter. Yep. Um, 150 days is it's a, a decent amount of time. I mean, it's nearly five months. So good. Good. You know, you you normally start horses, you know, in about six to eight weeks. Mm. Um, but you know, keeping in mind that these guys haven't even seen really humans in their whole life. Yeah. We have yeah. that little bit more time with them. So I think it's a good a good time frame. And then what about the time that you spent with the horse every day? You know, was it like you spent an hour? Did you spend five minutes some days? Did you spend, you know, three hours? About what time? Um, so every day was, was different. Um, initially, when you're trying to um, get the horse to trust you, of course, you're in there. You could be in there for you know, 45 minutes or an hour, just sitting there or just standing around and waiting for something to happen. Mm -hmm. Uh, Once you're more advanced in that training and you know exactly what you want to ask the horse on that day, if they get it, and and on some days he did, he got it in in 10 minutes. Now our sessions were over. Um, Other days we went in with a plan of what we wanted to achieve and he, he just had trouble understanding what I was asking and that's where I had to go back and refine what I was doing. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, that may have taken half an hour or 45 minutes, but you you do get to a, a point where you have to negotiate, I guess, with the horse a little bit because if you train for too long, they get bored um, and they stop listening and then you know, you don't achieve anything. So even if you, even if I couldn't achieve something with him that day, I'd go back to something that I knew that he could do. Okay, yep. I'd ask, ask him for that and then we'd finish the session. So, and some days when I was riding him, he he couldn't uh, bend properly and, and relax himself. So I'd actually jump off, do it on the ground and get back on and ask and then we finish. So, mm-hmm. look, your sessions can be anything from five minutes to whatever it really takes. But yep. the, the one thing I do have to say is don't don't be there for two hours trying the same thing mm-hmm. um, because your horse is going to get bored. So you, yep. yeah, that's where that negotiation comes in. Okay. Okay. That's good advice. Yep. All right. Now, just, just generally, you know, talking not young horses that are just starting, but generally the people that you train, you know, if you go out and you go to a group of new people, what's a common thing that you see that you start teaching? Say you're just going and doing a school or a clinic. What's a common exercise that you start off with for the riders? And also a, another one, a separate question, what's a common exercise you start off with for the horses? I'm thinking about just a training tip for them. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think one thing I see a lot of and the one thing that I do – to benefit both horse and rider is if I see somebody balancing on their mouth, which yep. is fairly common, I'll actually pop them on the lunge. They have to drop the reins and, you know, we go back to the basic stuff of holding the mane or, or something like that in order to balance balance the rider, mm-hmm. get their mm-hmm. leg position correct, carry themselves properly and not rely on the horse to, um, you know, to be expected to carry them. So, I do look for horse welfare before anything else, and that's usually coming from us as the rider. We do something and we may not even know we're doing it, and I look at that first. So putting a rider on the lunge and dropping the reins, um, if you have a horse that you can't do that to, then I may lead them around instead and, um, and you know, have to do some running around the arena, and that's fine with me. Um, and I also really like to take their stirrups away and learn to balance that way as well. So okay. I like balance, um, mm-hmm. and that's that's a two prong effect. You know, it's better for the horse. Yep. It's better for the rider. Yep. 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 So just getting those riders and getting an independent seat, and so they're um, they're working independently of their hands. That's- yeah. Exactly yeah. right. Yes, yes. What about horses? You know, what's a common if you were going to teach a group of riders or doing a clinic? What's it, if you've got like favourite warm up exercises or favourite, you know, just to see where they're going or, or even exercises to help improve problems? Yeah, absolutely. Look, the first thing that I normally do is I will ask them to just walk even or mm-hmm. walk and trot. 
yep. and ask for a halt and then ask for a turn. So what that says to me is how much control do you have over that horse? How much is that horse on the forehand? So if he's running through a stop, mm. he's very heavily on the forehand. Yep. Um, so we're, we want to look at teaching that horse to actually bend and soften through the neck, through the ribs and the hindquarters, so we yep. end up with that nice straight on the circle. Uh, because a defensive horse or a straight horse, you have very, very little control over. Um, and then we've got to learn that we don't turn the horse with the head, we turn the horse's shoulders. Mm-hmm. Um, so an, an exercise I like to do to, to start with is we just walk um, in a straight line. Yep. And then we will ask the horse to flex a little at the pole and see if they have any uh, flexion ability or if they're quite stuck and and tight and tense in the pole. Um, And then I'll ask them to come onto a circle and then we'll slowly start to almost leg yield in and out on the circle Mm -hmm. um, and just ask the horse softly to actually just loosen up um, in the pole. The other thing I really like to do is standing still, asking your horse to bend as best as you can around uh, to your leg, for example. Yep. Um, we're not dragging the horse around. We're doing it nice and soft and slowly. And then you put your inside leg on and ask the horse to move the hindquarters out. Yes. And while the hindquarters are moving out, we actually let that rein go and they step out of that bend. Mm-hmm. So we're 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 trying to engage some gymnastic ability, I guess, in that in that high court and asking them, you know, to soften and move and move, use their ribs, not brace against them. So yeah. just some yeah. basic exercises. And I suppose if you do that, you know, the exercise you talk where they're they're stepping out. Um, just moving the hindquarters away, you're testing right and left, so you're you're really seeing how the horse is going on the right, seeing how the horse is going on the left, and seeing where you know the stiff and hollow sides, and what you can do about correcting the horse to make them more evenly listen to the aids. Oh, absolutely, and and every horse, just like every person, has a weak side and a strong side, mm-hmm. um, and we use those. Um, those tools to see where their weaknesses are and where their strengths are and what we need to work on um, in order to, to help that horse and, you know, to soften a side. I also believe in doing it at walk and trot and even halt. Um, I don't even look at going into canter until I've really established what the issues are. And again, because if you go to canter and you're not a confident rider and you ask for something, um, or you don't have control, it's dangerous um, yes. for us as yep. the rider and also for the horse. Yep. Um, and you don't want to create confusion. You want to you want to build a relationship. Um, yes. And that relationship is built on trust that when you as the rider are asking your partner to do something, that they know that you're doing it because it's the best for them. Mm-hmm. And I find doing that in the, the slower gates is much better. If you're an equestrian coach or a horse riding instructor, or even if you aspire to be one, have a look at the free video series for horse riding instructors on the Horse Chats website. Go there now. Have a look. Horsechats.com. I think it's it's enough. You know, with the exercise, you said the walk, the trot, the halt, the turn, the exercises on the circle. It's almost like a diagnostic, like, let's see how you go here and then we know what we've got to work on. And even if you're working on walk and trot, sometimes if there's problems in the canter, they're caused in the walk and trot, aren't they? So you can work in the walk and trot, fix up some problems before they even go into canter. Oh, absolutely. Um, Absolutely. And when I first met somebody, um, if it's a a one-on-one lesson, it's a little Mm -hmm. harder when you're in a group. Yes. Um, But I'll just say to them, just go out, pretend I'm not here, just go and do what you would normally do, unless, of course, I see that the horse is um, really stressed out or Mm -hmm. dangerous. Mm -hmm. Then, of course, that won't happen. But um, And I just, you know, go and do your thing and then come back and we'll have a discussion and then go out and can you do these exercises for me and then so basically the first lesson is usually it like you say it's a diagnostic of where we're at yep and then by the end of that lesson um you can sort of say right this is what i see this is how i feel that we can move forward um this is sort of the plan i have in my mind of how we can achieve that and you know sort of 
a time frame because most people want some form of time frame. Yep. Um, which is it's quite doable, and, and sometimes you have to adjust to go along, but that's fine. Mm-hmm. Um, not not very often do things go perfectly to plan. So, sure, sure. Um, we have to adjust. Yeah. All right. Now, what are you looking forward to at the moment, Amy? What does your future hold? Oh, look, at the moment I um, I have a few young horses of my own to bring up and break in, so mm-hmm. I'll be starting on that uh, very shortly, um, probably within the next few weeks. Uh, also, I've had my Brumby having a break, so in the next few weeks he will come uh, back into work and we will uh, progress with him as well, so I have quite a few horses to to start, and and of course the babies to to bring on. Um, I do have one horse that's um, she's very um, up there, I guess, in dressage. So it's nice to get on an educated horse every now and again and refine your skills further up the grade. Sure. So that'll be uh, a big part of the next twelve months for me is uh, competing. Okay. Uh, there's a lot of work's gone into the Brumby, and it's my competition side sort of dropped off a bit. Um, okay. So looking yep. forward to competing again um, and getting out there, it, it will be a lot of fun. It's, I enjoy competing because I love the test of, Good. of what you have done at home mm-hmm. to when you get out to see what where you've missed, yes. things you need to go home and fix. Um, and, and it's a test of your training ability, That's how I look at it's feedback, isn't what it? I've done. You know, it's a judge saying, "This is what I think." So it's feedback given to you, yeah, to see how you're going at that level with that horse. Exactly right, and and you have to take that feedback on board, and and you know, you make your adjustments or you or you, you don't. Um, mm-hmm. It's it is feedback, and it's you know, but I take on board everything that the judge says because I also judge myself. So I will tell people what I see. Um, yep. And again, going back to asking for help, as a rider, if if you do a dressage test or you compete, whatever you do, mm-hmm. if you're not sure what a judge has said on your judging sheet, go to somebody that you trust and that you know yes, or your trainer get that. and yep. say, can you explain this to me or mm-hmm. how can I fix this? Yep. So it's very important. Yep, yep. All right. Now, Amy, can you sum up your – philosophy into, you know, training horses, training horses, just into a a couple of sentences just so we can sort of sum up and, um, you know, the listeners have got that fresh on their mind. My philosophy for training is that the horse is our best teacher Mm -hmm. and we have to look at what we're doing as the person and why a horse, if they're misbehaving, is doing it because in just about every case, it's our problem. It's it's a, a human problem, not mm, horse. Mm. So my philosophy is you take your time, you read your horse, and don't push your horse past what you know that it can do um, because just that little bit of additional time will give you a better result in the long run. So patience and time yep. is Yep. Absolute number one. Good, good. All right, now, Amy, how can people contact you? Um, so we have our Facebook page, which is Power Equestrian, and yep. it has a picture of uh, my Brumby on the, um, as the cover photo. Um, we also have a, a web page, which is www.powerequestrian.com.au. Um, and, of course, they can call me. My details are on Facebook um, and I'm always available, you know, if people have questions. And there's one thing that I didn't say before, which I think is really important, is the one thing I start with in lessons, not every rider gets on with every trainer. Um, So if people come to me, they may not like what I do or they may love it. I don't get offended if they say, no, look, I'm not... You know, I, I don't want to come back. Or mm-hmm. yes, I'm. I would love to come back because I think you've got to find a trainer that you trust and that you really respect as yes, well. Yes, yes, yes. And you know what? Sometimes it's not about the trust and the respect. Sometimes it's about you're a two-hour drive and I've got one twenty minutes down the road, or 
your price is X and, you know, I get more from you, but value-wise, this is better. Or my someone else, I can get a lift in the, in someone else's horse float to that trainer or they're available on such and such a time. It's not all about whether or not your training suits them. Sometimes it's all those other variables as well. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. There, there is a lot of variables uh, in it. Absolutely true. Yeah. So. Yeah. It's got to it's got to fit with our life as well because yes. we all have a life, and that extra hour drive or extra two <laughs> hour drive every yes. week. Yes, that's a lot of time it and is. me out of our pocket. So mm, mm. it's definitely true. All right, now, Amy. the The other thing is too that those details will be on horsechats dot com. So it's horsechats dot com slash Amy Power. If you go to horsechats dot com and just search for Power, I think you'll get Amy's link. You know, and that'll take you down, and that'll give you her Facebook page, her website, her email, a phone number, and everything else you need. So just go to horsechats dot com and search for Power, and you'll find Amy's details. Amy, thank you for coming on today. It was a good story telling us all about the Brumby Challenge and what you were doing with your horse VBA Brolga. You know, nice to sort of know that you've had that journey and people who've been following you on that journey will be able to, um, you know, to sort of have this summary with it as well. So that'll be good. Thanks for your time today and hopefully we'll talk to you sometime soon. Great. Thank you. Thanks, Amy. Bye-bye. Bye. Now, if you're still there, you probably know that I'm absolutely passionate about education within the horse industry. That's why I host this podcast. My other venture is Online Horse College. Have a look now at onlinehorsecollege.com and I'll see you over there. Remember that our comments and instructions are general in nature and do not take into consideration your individual horses or your individual ability and circumstances. If you enjoyed this podcast, then please leave your comment below 